And I'd like to introduce Walter Wynn, who will introduce our speaker for today. Good morning, I'm Walter Wynn. I live here in Oak Hammock in the Outback. And we will be having six classes, five more every week, except skipping the uh, August 14th week. So our Zoom Meister is Julianne, without whom we would be in deep trouble. So thank you, Julianne. For some of our session speakers will join us here in the Oak Room and other times speakers will join us by Zoom. Today we have a speaker and our, uh, my recruiter are here in the Oak Hammock, in the uh, Oak Room. A couple of years ago, Andre Cunningham came and spoke to us about uh, human skeletal morphology and how that can aid our understanding of migration histories. At that time, I asked if she would be interested in being a recruiter, and she accepted. Andre comes from Pembroke Pines, Florida, and she received her master's degree from UF in 2018, is now a PhD candidate. Her PhD topic studies are biosocial variation across sites of the slave trade. After receiving her PhD in 2022, she hopes to pursue a career in academia. Andre will induce our speakers for each session. Over to you, Andre. Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing our speaker, Molly Selba. So a bit about Molly. Molly comes from Fort Myers, Florida, and she received her BA degree from Johns Hopkins University in 2014 and is now a PhD candidate in the UF Department of Anthropology. Her dissertation topic studies comparative cranial morphology and the phenomenon of facial reduction. After she receives her PhD in the spring, Molly hopes to continue teaching either at the high school or college level. Uh, Molly, thank you for giving of your time today and you can start whenever you're ready. <laughs> All right, here we go. No mask here. Hi, good morning. If at, at any point you can't hear me, send up a hand and I will, oh, hello. Okay? Uh, sure, I look a little spooky, but as long as everybody is okay. Um, if you can't hear me, send up a hand and I will make sure that uh, I change my volume. Let's see if we can get this going. All right. Perfect. All right. So um, again, my name is Molly Selba. Um, and Today, what I want to talk to you about is not actually the content of my dissertation research. I know everybody is um, disappointed that we're not going to talk about uh, facial reduction in primates, bats, and dogs, um, but something else that I'm very passionate in, and that is um, teaching human evolution and why it matters. So this has been kind of a passion project of mine for the last five years. Um, and it's something I'm still working on today. So I wanted to kind of share this perspective with you about um, why I think that human evolution is a really important part um, and should be a really important part of our science curriculum. Um, and in many cases, it's not. So hopefully by the end, I will leave you um, with some, some thoughts on why I think it should be. Um, so again, I'm a PhD student at University of Florida. Um, studying cranial morphology and comparative anatomy. Um, and in a more recent plot twist, I'm also a full-time high school teacher um, in Northwest Georgia. Um, so while I'm finishing my dissertation, I decided to um, pick up a job there teaching um, anatomy and biology um, at the high school level. So I'm a teacher by day and a PhD student by night. Um, trying to finish up my dissertation uh, while teaching full-time. Um, so where did this all start, both in terms of the field um, of paleoanthropology and biological anthropology, but also my interest in um, trying to get this included in high school and middle school science curricula? 
Um, well, for me personally, it actually started when I was an undergraduate student at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I came in as an archaeology anthropology double major um, and loved everything about it. Um, very quickly started working on, on bones um, and looking at pathology and human variation and going to Italy to do my field work and all of these really wonderful experiences. And this is when I kind of started falling in love with the field of biological anthropology, of which I swiftly came here to UF to pursue a PhD um, in the same topic. Um, so for those of you who um, are unfamiliar with the field of biological anthropology, um, it is a scientific discipline that studies biological and behavioral aspects of human beings. So it's really what makes us, us um, on a biological level. So our bones, our genetics, all of these sorts of things. It also includes the study of our other non-human primates and also our extinct relatives. So members of our family tree who are no longer here. Um, it is part of the broader field of anthropology. So that's why my doctorate will be in anthropology. Um, and it's all things study of human beings. With that being said, what is biological anthropology not? And this is where we have a lot of confusion in kind of the general public about what, what doesn't fall under this field. What are some of the myths and misconceptions um, of human evolution and how it happened. Um, so the first one I always show is this um, schematic of like a chimp and then like a hunched over guy and a slightly less hunched over guy and then an upright guy and then maybe even somebody at a computer or on a tablet, depending on how, you know, present day we bring it. Um, but you may have seen this on a bumper sticker of a car or, um, you know, something like that. Um, this really linear progression of human evolution couldn't actually be further from the truth. We didn't, you know, have these successive ancestors that came and died off and were replaced and died off and were replaced and then us. Um, it, it was not linear like that at all. And the continuation of this type of schematic that shows kind of a really linear progression of human evolution um, perpetuates this this like incorrect idea that we had this really straightforward linear trajectory to how we are the way we are today. Um, some other misconceptions have to do with things like, well, if we evolve from apes, then why are apes still here? Or you hear this, if we evolve from monkeys then why are monkeys still here? Um, this comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of how speciation happens. Um, how phylogenies work, these sorts of things, which um, is content that we cover at the high, middle school, high school level. Um, but, you know, you kind of hear these misconceptions kind of thrown about. Didn't want to throw Tim Allen under the bus, but, um, you know, here he is. Um, also, this idea of, you know, the only important thing is to avoid going back, that back was somehow less or worse or um, archaic you know, or primitive to now. Um, and that's not really the case at all, right? We're constantly evolving to best fit our niche, right? The traits that help us survive are selected for. The traits that, you know, don't help us or actively uh, make it harder for us to reach adulthood and pass on our genes, those are weeded out of our gene pool. Um, so it's not a regression, you know, this isn't a getting to an idealized form. So this is kind of another misconception that actually goes back a long, long way, all the way to Plato and Aristotle with their idea on the far side of scala naturae, right? This great chain of being that you could take all of the living things on this earth and rank them from best to worst. And any guesses where humans were in that uh, kind of scale of being? We were right at the top. Yes, absolutely. A human made this uh, idea and we got to put ourselves right there at the top. But it perpetuated this idea that um, we are the ultimate form, right? Evolution is progressing towards our idealized 
I don't know, anatomy, culture, all of this sort of thing, and that everything is just trying to get to us. So I have a lot of questions from students like that of like, um, do you think that chimps will ever like evolve into humans? I'm like, no, you're kind of thinking about it like we're the idealized form and chimps are trying to get here, right? It's this kind of misunderstanding of where we fit into this whole picture and how evolution works. So these are some of the common misconceptions um, kind of broadly speaking that I, I see on a regular basis. So I got to grad school and I learned about all of this for the first time. I did not know about human evolution as a high school student in Florida. I went to a, um, an Episcopalian school and was not taught about this. Um, I did not learn it in my undergraduate studies. And so I came here to UF and I started taking classes and then subsequently teaching classes about human evolution and evolution more broadly. And I fell in love with it. And in considering why I had never learned about this before now, um, I kind of started asking people about their um, experiences with, with evolution and more specifically human evolution. Did you, you know, do you know about our human origin story? When did you learn about evolution? You know, to what extent, at what age, and where does your knowledge base start and stop? Really interested in hearing other people's kind of perspectives. And what I found out is that a lot of people don't understand that instead of that really linear progression that everybody thinks, the reality of the situation is actually far more interesting and in that we come from not only really a, a family tree, but a family bush. We've got a lot of different relatives that contributed to our anatomy and morphology the way that we are today and came before us. Um, and you know, are very much a part of our family tree. Granted, we're the only ones left, right, of this family tree. Sadly, we're the only hominins, members of our family tree still existing, um, but there's some good news there, right? Um, we carry some uh, Neanderthal DNA um, in our genetic makeup, so people in this room could have around 3% of their genetic material be Neanderthal DNA. So that's kind of exciting. We've kind of kept that around. But if you look back at our really elaborate family bush, right, with all these offshoots, um, you'll see different relatives that lived simultaneously the, to others. Um, we were not the only hominids living uh, in the world, we, right? We were never, we weren't always alone here. Uh, as we are now in our in our family tree, but um, we used to live right alongside other hominid species, Neanderthals, Denisovans. They're still coming up with um, like looking at the genetics and figuring out that there's at least one to two other, if not more, ghost uh, species of hominins that we can see evidence of in our genetic material that lived alongside us as well, and we just haven't found the um, fossils to go along with them but they've contributed to our DNA. We lived alongside them, we interbred with them. There's all this fascinating material. But going back even further, there are members of this family tree that we never crossed paths with. They, their species came and went um, before ours you know, came into existence. Um, there are uh, members of our family tree that lived exclusively in Africa. There are members of our family tree that left Africa and populated Europe and Asia. Um, there are members of our family tree that used tools that did cooperative hunting that had art. Um, there are members of our family tree that, uh, you know, relied on foraging um, more so than cooperative hunting. Um, we have a really rich, diverse family history that goes back 7 million plus years. Right, So not this little dinky linear progression, but really this rich family history that not a lot of people know about. Um, so just to give you the broad strokes, um, this is kind of how you could arrange some of the groups that I just mentioned here um, into an Ardipithecus group, an Australopithecus group, a Paranthropus group, and then Homo group. And of course, the, that's our genus. So just to give you a little bit of information on each one, Ardipithecus group, this is our earliest link to other primates. 
um, they evolved in Africa and took the first steps to walking upright. Um, they're pretty small and um, they still had kind of prominent canine teeth, which you can tell we have really reduced canine teeth today, the kind of pointy ones um, off to the side. So, you know, this is kind of some of the earliest members of our family tree think all the way back to around 7 million years ago. Um, the next group kind of come about, kind of a direct descendant of that group is the Australopithecus group, arguably one of the, the most interesting, I think. Um, these guys walked upright on a regular basis. Um, so obligate bipeds, right? Um, they spent still some time in the trees. Um, their skull, they're getting a little bit bigger in terms of their brain size um, and their body size. And this group contains the famous Lucy um, specimen. So if you've heard of Lucy, um, who is named because they were listening to um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds as they were pulling her remains out of the ground, a um, really famous specimen, fairly complete specimen with a pelvis, which was super cool because we could find out more about how they locomoted, how they walked around. Um, this is the Australopithecus group. And then we have our weird cousins. And that's how I always introduce these guys to uh, people that I'm talking about human evolution with. We had like that weird aunt or weird uncle. I tell my students, this is like our great, 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 great uncle that, you know, was a part of our family tree, but very different kind of than the rest. And these are the Paranthropus, this Paranthropus group. So we have several species in this group and they, no longer had access to soft things like fruits to eat. And instead they had these really crazy weird adaptations that were more similar to like a cow than to members of our own family tree. They had these huge megadont teeth, ginormous teeth. Um, they had these crazy sagittal crests. So I call it a bony mohawk that runs the length of their skull where their chewing muscles would attach to. Um, their chewing muscles were like five to six times thicker than ours. They had the exact same muscles we have today, but they were the thickness of like a steak. Um, because they were eating what anthropologists like to call fallback foods, um, things that nobody else really wanted to eat, but you know, you gotta survive. So we're talking things like um, uh, roots and tubers. They didn't have stone tools or really fire, so we're eating them raw, um, and also a lot of grasses and sedges. So they were kind of our weird cow cousins. Fascinating group. They came, they went. Um, they were fairly successful for a period of like one to two million years, but unfortunately they were um, essentially gone before our specific genus entered the scene, which is a genus Homo. So we're Homo sapiens. Um, this is our group, really diverse group though. Um, tool use is seen really consistently for the first time in this group, which is pretty cool. Um, we have lots of different size skulls going on in this group, including really, really big Neanderthal skulls and really, really little Homo floresiensis skulls. So the hobbit people of the island of Flores that um, had some island dwarfism. They got really teeny tiny um, because they were stuck on this island for a really long time. I love the phenomenon of um, like island dwarfism. Small things get really big and big things get really small. So there were pygmy like um, hippos and elephants, but then there are also like giant lizards. Um, it seems like a really, if I could zap myself to a specific point in time, I would absolutely go to the island of Flores while it was inhabited by um, Homo floresiensis because they were teeny tiny, but there's, then they had these little pygmy hippos and things. It was fascinating. So really cool. All of this is part of our genus. We had this really round skull going on. We have these delicate little features that we still have going on. Our canine teeth essentially went away at this point. Well, they're still there, but very reduced. Um, and this group had, um, members that left Africa and populated Europe and Asia, right? So kind of left and explored the, the rest of the world. So again, that first top picture is not actually what it look, evolution looked like. And instead you see this really chaotic branching, um, interweaving, 
trajectory of our of our human origin story of our family tree. So some species split off and came back around, some split off and were never a part of our gene pool again and went extinct. Um, we have a lot of interweaving. And so now scientists call this the braided stream analogy. So just as a stream, as it meanders through the, you know, the land breaks off and comes back around and some little tributaries go off, that's kind of what our evolution looked like. Right? So this is the reality of our human origin story. It's complex and it's beautiful and there's all sorts of um, intricacies and all this neat stuff going on. But, you know, I'm fascinated with this. I'm so excited that we have all these really cool members of our family tree and our human origin story is so interesting. And I, you know, we tell this to students of like, look at our family tree. It's, it's so fascinating. It's so cool. And the question I get, you know, a lot is, but where are those fossils? I believe you. It sounds cool. That was a nice picture. Um, but where are those fossils? And I don't blame them. That's a good picture. I'm essentially telling them, you know, believe me when I say our family tree is super diverse and fascinating. Um, but I can't hand you a fossil to show you this, right? Um, so where, where are those fossils? Many of them are in the fossil primate and hominid vault in the Evolutionary Studies Institute at the University of Witwatersand in um, South Africa. It's a fascinating place called the vault amongst paleoanthropologists. Um, it's kind of a club of people. Oh, I've been in the vault. Have you been in the vault? I have not been in the vault, but I hope to one day go and visit. But this is where a lot of those beautiful discoveries are kept. And it's not just a few bones, right? And, you know, it's, there's definitely some species that we don't have great representation of, but there are a lot of fossils that contribute to this narrative of our human origin story. There's full skulls, there's feet, there's pelvis, there's little tiny fragments, there's individual teeth. There's all of these different, all of this different fossil evidence that has contributed to our understanding of how we got here and what our family tree look like, right? It's, there's a lot of it out there. Next question is, but why isn't it taught in, in K-12, right? In middle school, high school. If we have all this fossil evidence and we have a good understanding of what our family tree was like, why isn't this taught in, in elementary schools? I'm sure you can think of some, some reasons why, but if you look in the literature, and there is quite a bit of research that's been done on this, um, there are very well researched difficulties associated with trying to teach this, try to teach evolution and more specifically human evolution um, at the middle school and um, high school level. First obstacle about more ev evolution more broadly is general skepticism and academic mistrust on the part of students, right? I'm telling you, believe me, this is our human origin story. Isn't it fascinating? I can't show you a fossil, show you how I know this, but I want you to believe me. There is a fair amount of skepticism and academic mistrust. And this is a phenomenon we see kind of continuing and growing today. Um, another obstacle is the lack of comprehensive and consistent, or cons consistent statewide standards for the teaching of evolution in schools. So, I know about this as I've taught, I've <laughs> visited many classrooms in Florida and now I'm a Georgia teacher. From state to state, um, we don't have consistent standards that, that mandate evolution be included in public science curriculum for public schools. Um, typically now evolution is included. Human evolution is not necessarily specifically included. However, I will say that this isn't something that, you know, we finally got evolution added to the curriculum, check that off our list. It is still being voted on in Florida regularly. And the last time it was voted on, it passed by one vote to keep it in the science curriculum. So this is something that we, we still need to very much be aware of um, because it's still going on and not all the states have um, consistent standards in how to teach this sort of topic in schools. And then finally, something that we've seen a lot of in this last year, um, there's a prolific misunderstanding of what constitutes a scientific theory. So when I say the theory of evolution, 
Um, I'm not talking about the colloquial use of the theory, like I have a theory that I could, you know, make a slam dunk if I tried really hard um, and a basketball hoop, something like that, the colloquial use of theory, right? Um, that's very different than a scientific theory. Um, and this, you've seen a lot of, you've likely seen a lot of this discourse happening around a lot of the COVID um, stuff as well. So a misunderstanding of what constitutes a theory. When you look at human evolution specifically, um, there's a lack of up-to-date teaching materials geared towards K-12 educators in this topic. Um, there, the kind of running joke is paleoanthropology changes so fast and so much by the time they were done printing the textbook, it would be obsolete. Um, so it's really hard to have good, consistent, up-to-date uh, literature or teaching materials on this topic because scientific discoveries are happening in this field yearly, you know, all the time. So that is a, that's a big challenge. Um, and finally, again, that tangible nature of the fossil record itself and the fact that many of these fossils are held in vaults like the one in South Africa um, is really challenging for students. And so teachers who have tried to teach this content area in the past have had to resort to purchasing really expensive casts of some of these fossils and at the, you know, at a, as a public school teacher, those resources are not often available to, to purchase these really expensive casts. They're also often or were historically ceramic and one drop from a student and they're, they're broken into a bunch of pieces. They're very fragile. I think Andrea and I have both taught with the same ceramic casts and we're always like, go easy, go easy because you break them and they're, um, very expensive to replace. Um, so the innately tangible nature of the fossil record isn't something that's easily conveyed to students because they're not likely to ever actually hold these fossils in their hands. Um, and these fossils form the very basis of our understanding of human evolution, of our, of our origin story, right? So this is really a big hurdle to overcome. Um, and it can further the misconception that evolution is something you can choose to believe in, that it's a belief system and it's not a body of knowledge that is supported by a ton of physical fossil evidence. Um, so this is a really big obstacle in trying to teach this um, at the middle school and high school level. Um, so you see things like, you know, it, it perpetuates this idea that evolution is something you can believe in. I went to go see an evolution educator speak at a conference and she's very well known. Um, she uh, teaches evolution in the South um, and that's, she's from Alabama and has made a career of learning how to teach um, evolution with radical empathy in predominantly religious communities. And she started her talk by saying, um, I don't believe in evolution. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in the wrong talk. Um, but she said, I don't believe in evolution, but rather I accept the overwhelming scientific evidence that supports evolution. And this is still something I work with a lot of teachers. I've done teacher workshops on this material and even, you know, the most well-intentioned teachers will slip into, you know, well, it's okay. I don't really care if, you know, if students believe in education or believe in evolution or not, or, you know, these types of things. No, that's what I'm trying to get us away from. Don't couch it as, you know, do you believe in evolution? It's rather, do you accept and acknowledge the body of physical fossil evidence that supports our understanding of how we got to be here, right? Um, if no, that's okay, but um, it's not a belief system. And I can talk more about that at the end of where uh, religion and science kind of diverge, um, but, this is a big misnomer. And the fact that we continue to talk about evolution as something we can choose to believe in um, reflects in the public acceptance of evolution. You can see United States way down here at the bottom, right above Turkey. Um, more than, you know, this is not a problem the way it is in the United States in Europe. They don't have the same quandary that they're trying to get over. Um, and in, this is a little bit of an older infographic, uh, 2006, but um, the U.S. really struggles with this. So um, this is something that I've tried to be really cognizant of in my quest to better understand the teaching of human evolution at the high school level. Um, 
So I decided to try to do something about this and I created the Human Evolution Teaching Materials Project. It's an unfortunate name, but it stuck before I was able to come up with something catchier, but um, I lovingly call it HETMP. And for the last five years, I have been working with teachers um, to provide resources for middle and high school level science educators to facilitate the inclusion of human evolution into their existing science curricula, not to re, you know, structure their curriculum, provide them with the resources, activities, labs, PowerPoints, um, guest speakers, whatever they need to just sprinkle this into their current conversations about evolution and science. Right. Um, so to help them and the way that I figured out how to do this or the way that I came up with to address some of these bigger obstacles is through the use of 3D prints. And somebody once told me that I have 3D printed more hominin crania than anybody in the United States. I don't know how to get that uh, verified, that statistic verified, but um, it might be Guinness Book of World Records uh, material. So I probably should. But informally, I have printed more. 3D printed more hominin crania than anybody else in the United States. Um, a lot, right? All of these ones, I, I printed them. I would be running five, six 3D printers at the same time, printing sets, loaner sets to send to schools, for me to bring to schools, for teachers that didn't have access to them. I was shipping them all over the country and sometimes abroad. This was my way of combating the fact that I can't put the actual physical fossils in the hand of the students. So I 3D printed them. Scientists are making huge, you know, contributions to um, our understanding of human evolution and are making 3D files of a lot of the fossils available for the first time ever. This is a big deal for paleoanthropologists because they have a history of hiding fossils under the floorboards of their house so that nobody else can see them. This is a real story of things that have happened in, in paleoanthropology. But now we've kind of turned this corner and they're making these files available. So I'm helping teachers print them. I'm printing them and sending them to schools and I'm teaching teachers how to use them in their curriculum to get at least something in the hands of students. And this started off as a one woman show. I was driving across the state of Florida with a trunk full of fossils or with uh, 3D printed fossils. Um, my collection grew and grew. Um, I did classroom visits, typically middle school, high school classrooms, but sometimes the itty bitties too. Um, I served on panels at Catholic schools and evangelical schools to answer questions about evolution that their students had. Um, so one of these is from a Catholic school that I visited on the other coast um, of Florida. And I kept doing this and I brought in undergrads and I brought in other uh, students and I held workshops for teachers and I got them to learn how to do this and how to train other teachers. And then six years later, I had interacted with over um, 1200 students um, in Florida, Georgia, Texas, um, and other places virtually as well. But helping them learn about this. And I really took the approach of not saying this is human evolution, I want you to believe me, but instead just presenting them with the fossil evidence and saying, you know, what conclusions do you come to by looking at this fossil evidence on your own? Um, and it was, it was so much fun, we had a blast. Um, so for six years, I was touring all around, doing lots of classroom visits, education outreach visits, um, meeting a lot of wonderful educators. And in doing these visits, we had a lot of cool conversations, um, myself and the educators, myself and the students. Um, sometimes they asked me kind of basic questions or um, random questions. You know, um, if a Neanderthal walked by me right now, would I be able to tell that he was a Neanderthal? Like, I, that's a, I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> that's a great question. You know, how tall would these people have been? What would this have been like? Do you know if they would, you know, common curiosity that kids have? But they raised other questions that were actually quite profound and led to some really interesting, you know, insight that I gained about them, but also that they were able to kind of express to me. There were questions about race. There were questions about religion and where this fit into their worldview. Um, there were questions about the nature of science. How does science happen? Um, what if a scientist makes a mistake? Um, how is science self-correcting? 
they were able to have these very mature conversations about what are considered very taboo topics. Um, and they, you know, handled these, you know, taboo or complex topics with a lot of grace and with a lot of inquisitive questions. And they really didn't feel inhibited or, I don't know, um, feeling like this is something that they're not supposed to be learning about. They asked some really wonderful questions and it's the conversations that I had in these classrooms that were arguably the best part of the six years I spent um, touring all over the place interacting with these students. Um, I led a teacher workshop. I invited 20 teachers from the Southeastern United States to come to the University of Florida for a four day workshop that happened about two years ago, like right now. Um, we're sharing all these memories in our teacher group. We had really great speakers, including active paleoanthropologists, um, evolution educators, all sorts of um, people came. We learned about 3D printing. We learned about um, what's actually going on in the field right now. It was a really awesome and productive um, teacher professional development workshop. Um, this is what we look like, we even got back together and attended another one in Texas um, that next year. And I still am very close with this group of educators today and they're still actively incorporating human evolution into their curriculum and leading their own teacher workshops to teach other teachers what they learned. So really, really neat. Um, I'm still publishing a paper on um, some data I collected from this workshop, but I'll give you guys a sneak peek of the things that I found. Um, so when I asked teachers at the end of the workshop um, a little bit about their experience with teaching human evolution, there were some major trends that I found. Um, the first is that teachers don't feel empowered to teach human evolution. They don't typically get admin support. There are not the materials out there to help facilitate this. Um, and there are not a lot of professional developments that even cover this topic. So, you know, how can you teach something that you don't know or don't feel comfortable with? Um, the other thing I learned is to teachers, science literacy is important, almost above all else. And as a science teacher myself, I can confirm this of like, if a student gets nothing out of my class, if they leave um, with a good sense of science literacy, that is what I'm going for. So um, I saw a lot of teachers that first and foremost, above the content itself, science literacy is a huge um, goal for them. Um, and then finally, I learned that science storytelling is the key. That, you know, not the textbooks of maybe your high school science class, read page 258 through 274 and, you know, take notes. It is now the way, the, uh, how we teach science now or the most effective way to teach science is through storytelling, talking about the scientists themselves and the exploration stories and the discovery stories. And human evolution has a great um, wealth of these types of stories associated with um, this field. Uh, there's lots, right? So we have the underground astronauts. We had this recent discovery around five, this years ago, Homo lady, it was a new um, species in our genus, Homo, in this cave system in South Africa. And they had to have splunkers, cave divers, go down and like fish out these remains. But they needed people with caving experience that had degrees in paleoanthropology and previous field work experience. And you probably think, how many people have all those qualifications? Um, they got over 50 responses back. It was actually an initial Facebook post that uh, was the job ad. And the people that they chose to represent this team who they call the underground astronauts because they have to suit up kind of like astronauts to go down into this cave system were all women. Um, coincidentally, they had the research, they had the small body size that you need to get into these cave systems. At the narrowest, um, they're around 12 inches across. So very, very tiny spaces, I, you know, um, in the Pro Museum in, um, in Texas, you can try to wiggle through one of the chutes to see what it was like. And I got in there and I got right back out. Um, not my thing, but these really wonderful, awesome scientists, um, this was their job. They were the first crew of underground astronauts. 
Um, there have been subsequent kind of iterations, generations of underground astronauts who do a lot of outreach work, but to see some of the little girls faces in the classes I visit light up when they realize that it's a team of women paleoanthropologists that are, you know, going underground and pulling out these fossils is quite cool. Um, and it's a really wonderful way of, of uh, sharing science through storytelling. Um, and it just gets better and better. These discoveries are happening all the time. Um, sort of recently in the top left corner um, is a Neanderthal burial that they found um, evidence of pollen and kind of where it was situated. This Neanderthal individual had a flower burial. There were flowers laid at their grave when they were buried. Like how, I don't know, personal, it, like it's such a unique thing to think about, right? These hominins, Neanderthals live right alongside us, interbred with us, we carry some of their genes and they buried their dead very much like we do today, right? So really profound. Um, there was a discovery not long ago where they were able to do some genetic work on the specimen and found that this individual's mom was a Neanderthal and her dad was a Denisovan, two completely different species of hominid. Like first generation, mom was a Neanderthal, dad was a Denisovan. So fascinating, right? We knew this happened at some point, right? Because we have their genetic material in our genome. But like we found the child who is the direct, you know, product of two different species in our family tree. Like how cool. Um, at the bottom side over there, we have some of the earliest art that we've ever found, right? These are Neanderthal um, carvings. There's 3D files of this available online to 3D print and bring to classrooms. But in terms of like, when did, we, when did art come around? These are a lot of questions I get from kids. Art, um, singing, you know, religion. When did these things come around? We have some really cool evidence of like, they were making art um, a really, really long time ago. And then up in the top corner is a discovery that was announced two weeks ago, a new species in our genus, Homo longi. longi which I think they might be changing the name, so don't get too attached to that. This is pretty new information. Um, but a brand new member of our family tree that was discovered three weeks ago. So literally, this is happening so fast. Um, and it's, we're learning more and more. And every time we get a new piece of the puzzle, it disrupts some of what we thought we know. But that's kind of a cool thing to teach kids too, that science is not, this is the truth, it's never gonna change. Instead, it's this is the best understanding we have right now. And as we continue to get more evidence, it's either going to confirm what we know or we're gonna have to change our understanding of how it happened. So really cool way to get them to understand nature of science. Um, as I mentioned, I now do this for a living. I'm a teacher at Pope High School in uh, Marietta, Georgia. Um, I really wanted to work on tackling the science, science literacy problem that we have in our country. So I figured if I was gonna be dissertating, I might as well also be teaching. Um, so I teach 132 high schoolers um, anatomy and this year I'll be adding biology. And it's been a really cool experience to now be on the other side. I've worked with educators for six years and now I am one. So there are a lot of things I learned, um, you know, were I've now learned from kind of the other side. And it was a weird year to be a teacher. Um, this is what my virtual setup looked like. We did a mock forensics case um, on the left side. Um, on the right side, you can see some of my kids back um, hybrid. So you see some faces on Zoom and some kids in the classroom as well, um, masked up with dividers, um, doing an owl pellet dissection. So it was a really interesting and fascinating year to be a first year educator because there were some kind of new hurdles we had to address. Um, when I, and I used a lot of the lesson materials that I had made for teachers in the last six years in my own classroom this year, because we talk about cranial morphology and the bones of the skull. And this pairs really well with these lessons where we're looking at the skulls of our hominin ancestors. And when I taught this for the first time as their teacher and not just a visitor, um, or not just somebody making lesson materials for a different teacher, I found some weird or some interesting misconceptions that students have still. Um, very kind of specific ones. The first one is that humans aren't animals. So humans are animals. 
some, this typically happens a little bit more with the younger students, but um, for some reason, if you asked students to classify humans, they would not put them in animals or mammals. We're also primates. A lot of people don't know that. And many people don't know that humans are apes. Apes are tailless primates. And last time I checked, no tail. Um, so we are considered apes. So this is a, a misconception I still see in the classroom today. Um, the second one is that humans are exempt from evolution. This is fascinating being an, uh, an anatomy teacher because we talk a lot about the evidence that humans are still evolving today, right? Um, you can think palmaris longus muscle, right? If you, we have a lot of people kind of missing this uh, muscle that was used kind of for brachiating going through the trees. You can look at um, things like lactose intolerance. You can look at things like, um, there's a lot of interesting research just in our shift um, from relying much more heavily on C-sections, how that has changed um, head dimensions in babies, right? We can accommodate a much bigger headed baby now than we could ever previously. Um, so humans are still evolving today, but if you ask students that, they think that we are exempt from evolution or we've been there, done that, we reached the ideal you know, form and we're no longer subject to those pressures. But we talk a lot about in my class that humans are the product of and subject to evolution, just like any other animal. We are an animal, right? Um, this is a prolific misunderstanding. Um, you know, so that's another one. Um, another one is that we chose our adaptations. I get a lot of questions. Do you think that we will evolve longer thumbs so that texting will be easier? You know, those types of things. Um, we don't will our evolution to go in a specific generation. And if that trait is not impacting our ability to reach adulthood and pass our genes on to the next generation, it will not impact, you know. Um, sorry, one more time? Yes, exactly. If it doesn't impact our survival, and our ability to pass our genes on, we're not gonna see evolution kind of trend towards a specific direction. But a lot of kids think, you know, um, we're looking at our phones more. Will we be, you know, have our, our hands a specific way or our heads a specific way? Um, I ask them, do you think that you'll survive better if you were like that? No, okay, well then, no, probably not. So we talk a lot about that as well. Um, so unless it directly impacts your fitness as a species, you, you can't just will, different traits into existence. So these misconceptions are still very much a part of our students' world. Um, and it, it changes how they perceive us and our world and how we fit into it. Um, so I said I would be telling you why this matters. And to me, it matters maybe more than most. I know it's kind of a niche subject area, um, but I've seen the value in teaching this topic um, at the you know middle school, high school, college, grad, grad level, um, and I really think that it's something worth teaching, and here's why. Um, first, it's our communal origin story. This is something that everyone in this room, everyone in this country, everyone in this world shares in common, right? This is our family tree. This is our origin story. Um, it's very much a communal thing. Um, it helps us conceptualize our role as primates and as animals and as you know, members of the natural world, right? Um, with things like conservation and um, deforestation and all of these different, um, I don't know, things going on right now. If students understand that we are animals, we're primates, um, they might have a more vested interest in preserving our world, right? We're not kind of the dictators or controllers of our world. We're animals trying to survive um, on it as well. Um, it helps students better understand the nature of science because human evolution is constantly changing. So it's not something I can just tell you, this is the way that it is and it will always be like this. Um, it's constantly changing and we need to get students okay with that fact, right? We make mistakes. We, you know, don't have all of the pieces yet um, that, and that's okay. So that is kind of a really big part of why human, human evolution is so interesting to teach. Um, it help, encourages conversations about touchy or taboo subjects. And I've seen firsthand that students can handle learning about and talking about and having positive, effective discourse on what are perceived as touchy or taboo subjects. Um, they, you know, have, they ask very insightful and wonderful questions. I've never had a negative experience with a student 
um, in teaching human evolution, right? Parents, different story. Students, they come at it in a very respectful and inquisitive way. Um, this in human, teaching human evolution and teaching the teaching of biological anthropology as a whole um, allows us to also address the racist history of the field of anthropology, which I think is very important. Um, anthropology is the reason um, in large part that the eugenics movement happened. Um, it was used for a long time to justify why different races were better than others, right? There's a really problematic past here, um, but we can't shy away from that. So continuing to teach biological anthropology allows us to address those um, you know, issues and times in the past that we were very misguided um, and not kind of shirk away from that. So not necessarily at the high school level, but especially at the college and graduate level. And there are really important conversations about um, the role anthropology played in some of these very problematic ideas um, that definitely need to happen. Um, and finally, this topic inspires unity, specifically human evolution inspires uni unity in an increasingly divisive time. Um, I came across this quote while I was researching the teaching of human evolution, and it really um, stuck with me, and it's only become more relevant as the time has gone by. Um, it's the knowledge of who and what we are that we can hold in common in our increasingly pluralistic society. Um, and kids love this. They look across the room and they know that this is a shared story of everybody here, of me, of them, you know, of their family, of people all around the world. This is our human origin story. Um, so that's another one of the benefits of teaching this subject material. Um, hopefully I was able to kind of convince you of the value of teaching this topic. Does anybody have any questions? Perfect. Thank you, you uh, make a powerful case for teaching evolution. Uh, I taught science uh, a long time ago, the early 60s in New York, wow. and we had no problem introducing evolution ideas. But by the time I uh, retired as an administrator, there was a group, a very powerful group, a well-organized group that advoca advocated divine creation, and they were really pushing at it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wonder if you encountered that and had any problems with it. Um, that's a great question. So again, so in the you know 1,200 students that I've interacted with and teachers that I've interacted with, I have not had any pushback. Um, however, it's, there's a little bit of self-selection going on. So the teachers that want me to come work with them are typically interested and have the ability to um, introduce this topic in their curriculum. Um, so that's one element of it. Um, another element of it is that many of them choose to be proactive about me coming and warn parents um, that I'm coming. I this It's not something that I... Um, we, we talked a lot about it at the professional development of like, what are, what are our thoughts collectively on doing an opt-in or an opt-out sort of situation? In my opinion, not, uh, I guess that um, amazing evolution educator that I talked to said, teach, um, don't teach the, the, um, the conflict, right? Teach the topic, not the conflict. If you go into it like, we're going to talk about something that some people have a big problem with and you kind of like build it up in that way. It kind of gets everybody a little bit more riled up. But if it's just a part of evolution, um, you know, evolution is in the state standards for Georgia. Um, I just happen to teach that with humans instead of horses or uh, finches or turtles or whatever other thing is evolving. Um, but I have heard stories from teachers in Florida that have um, had students uh, have had to allow students to sit outside in the hallway when they taught this topic, um, have had students that come in with laminated cards um, with like ways to stump the teacher from their parents um, that their parents sent them to school with. Um, I had, I've heard, you know, of uh, cases where teachers have had to allow the students that were not comfortable to read their Bibles while they taught evolution in class. So that definitely is out there. Um, luckily, I think it's going away in large part, um, but it's still, depending on the school, it still is very much happening. But I've been invited to speak at 
Catholic schools, fundamentalist Christian schools, um, and they're very open to, to me being there. It was, I was on a panel, it was me, a priest, um, a, a, like a ecology, somebody who did ecology, evolution and ecology, um, and then the teacher, and we were the panel discussing evolution, which I thought was kind of fascinating. So he, the priest was there to kind of say, this all checks out with the Bible. <laughs> so it, it seemed to go really well. It was a productive conversation, but I do know that that pushback can be out there, but um, it's getting more and more rare. Yeah. Two things. Um, first of all, where did you get the software? How was that produced? for the 3D images, I, for the 3D uh, making of the skulls. Uh, that's the hard part, the software. Uh, the printing's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, that's number one. And number two, what happened to my good friend, Crow Magnan? He, as you know, he had a much bigger brain than we have. How come he didn't survive? Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so for your first question, wonderful question. So this is actually something that a lot of paleoanthropologists are incorporating into their, um, like their research funding is paying for the, like the, they're typically uh, surface scanners or CT scanning either way. Um, and they're kind of budgeting for that as a part of their grants to do this work with the expectation that they will scan these crania and then make them available publicly or use them um, as a part of their own research digitally, which is something that actually both Andrea and I do. We uh, look at CT data digitally and analyze it that way. So it can actually be of good use to scientists. They typically pick one specimen to release to the public. Um, they keep most of the goodies for themselves, but it has to do with just either surface scanning it or popping it into a CT scanner. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so Re that- uh, Repeat the question, please. Just repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so where specifically are these scans coming from, disseminating out of? Um, it's, so uh, to my knowledge, so the paleoanthropologist that was in that picture of the vault, he is very influential in making them available. So he has made a lot of the ones that he has put into the vault available. Um, there are ones that have been in the vault long before he got there and our, he was not the finder of them. And I think it typically falls to the discoverer of whether or not they're comfortable with it being made public. Um, so there are some famous paleoanthropologists right now that have uh, very clearly said, no, I'm not okay with that. Um, so that is a little bit challenging, but there's a lot of pushback at this time for uh, scientists to be making this open open source, there's a lot of questions about like, you know, I'm giving it to high schoolers, we aren't trying to publish a paper here. So you can kind of lower the resolution, those sorts of things, um, and they, it doesn't typically interfere with their researching. But a lot of them already have them digitized and um, it looks good for them to make it public. So they, but um, out of uh, Max Planck in Leipzig, Germany, they have digitized a bunch. So all over the world, this is happening. And every time somebody finds something new, they get a barrage of emails like, um, hi, are you gonna make this available? Um, and then once it's available, it just goes on a jump drive and right into a 3D printer of which UF has a really wonderful facility um, if anybody's ever interested. Um, Cro-Magnum man. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I don't know, Andrew, you might, I might wanna know your impact on that because that has just not really been the focus of, I don't know, the teaching of paleoanthropology in a long time. I'm pretty sure that that was like, it's not homo sapiens, early homo sapiens. But Neanderthals uh, had a larger, larger cranial capacity than we did. So Neanderthals, cavemen, I guess. Um, and so that is also a big question I get from students of like, if you trace our brain size, relative to our body size, it goes like this, right? And we are big brained for our body size, but Neanderthals were actually had bigger brains. They are also a little bit stockier. 
um, and it did not provide them any sort of competitive advantage when it came to outliving us. They were bigger, yeah. And it had a lot to do with the climate in which they were living. They were kind of cold weather adapted. So these really big nasal cavities, all this really interesting thing. But another thing we talk about, which is really fascinating too, um, is about, so selection pressure, right? What we were talking about. Brains are calorically expensive. Um, so there's two kind of major issues. One is if you have a really big brained baby that, um, obstetrics start to be an issue, right? Birthing a big brained baby can be challenging and complicated and fatal if it's the baby's head's too big. Um, the other thing is brain needs a lot of calories to survive. Um, like to, can you, to power your brain, you need to eat a lot of calories. So it, it really is, there has to be a very strong selective pressure for a big brain or else it, will, it just will not happen. Because if you can get by in your everyday life with a smaller brain, um, then it is more, it's easier to power and you don't have as much of an issue with birthing. So the selective pressure for a big brain has to be very, very strong for us to see these brains get bigger, which is kind of cool because that happened to us. So you have to wonder, you know, a lot of people argue it was the social element, right? We're doing a lot of cooperative, um, I don't know, hunting and uh, teaching each other and speaking and all this kind of stuff that this might have contributed to why we have especially a really large frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex. Um, could it have been like things like cooperative hunting? Um, it's actually very closely linked that first initial spike in brain size to when we started cooking our food and incorporating more cooked meats into our diet. Um, that's when we had the calories available, this nutrient dense diet to power our really big brains. So there's a lot there and a lot of it's still not totally sussed out, but um, the big brain question is something we're all still working on. Um, and I have a question here. Human jaw is changing from lack of chewing as much as we used to consuming more softer processed food. Absolutely. So part of that is um, our wisdom teeth and the fact that they are um, often impacted or don't erupt. Um, we have a kind of daintier jaw and whole chewing complex now that we eat predominantly soft um, foods. So that is something that um, is absolutely tied to our changing diet. Um, and part of, we have, I have this really wonderful lab that we look at the teeth of all of these different members of our human family tree. And we have just this little dainty um, you know, teeny teeth, I'm um, in this kind of dainty uh, mouth. And it really kind of marks when we started having cooked food, um, really diverse nutrient dense diet, um, and kind of a processed meal where and especially reliance on stone tools where we no longer had to um, pull things right off the, the bone. I um, mean, we could kind of cut up our food and macerate it and cut it down quite substantially before even getting it in our mouths, we see this marked change towards um, softer or smaller jaws and our, unfortunately, our wisdom teeth uh, not descend, not coming in or getting impacted. That was a great question. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. Thank you to Andrea, <laughs> Andriana and Molly and Mr. Wynn, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next week.